Welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We're meeting today to consider the agency's operating plan for current fiscal year 2025. We're in an extremely tight fiscal environment, have been for quite some time now. I want to start by thanking staff for all the sacrifices they've been making doing their jobs with fewer resources. In anticipation of a continuing flat funding, uh, which is a, a effectively a significant cut in our budget, given rising costs, uh, we took steps over the last year to reduce our staff levels and our spending. You know, currently, we're operating with 9% fewer staff than we were a year ago. We're under a critical hiring program in which we're not necessarily replacing the staff when they leave and have unfilled positions across the agency that we can't afford to fill. Across the board, we've cut our rulemaking research engagement, enforcement, and consumer education budgets, limiting our impact and outreach on key safety issues. And we've dramatically cut back on staff travel and professional development. And we've decreased office budgets across the agency. Nevertheless, staff has remained dedicated to CPSC's mission to protect the American public from the hazards associated with consumer products. And I cannot thank them enough for the work that they do and their dedication and their continued efforts. Um, the base level and operating plan for us assumes that we'll be funded at a continuing resolution level for the coming year. It also provides details on how we could spend additional funding if it were provided with the full amount in the president's budget request. I know that each of us up here is thinking about how to best prioritize those limited resources, and there are no easy choices. But I believe the operating plan that staff presented us with is a good one. And it provides the commission with a solid, responsible plan given our budgetary constraints and uncertainty. I hope my colleagues and I can find consensus and a final operating plan that stays close to the staff's proposal. This time, we're going to start with questions for the staff and available to answer questions here are Austin Schlick, Executive Director, Dwayne Ray, Deputy Executive Director for Safety Operations, Annette Evans, Deputy Executive Director for Operations Support, Brian Burnett. Director of Office of Information Technology Services, Lynette Wallace, Director of Office of Human Resource Management, Rob Carroll, CPSC's Budget Officer from the Office of Finance Management, Planning and Evaluation, Pam Springs, Director of Office of Communications, Dwayne Boniface, Director of the Office of Risk Reduction, and Rob Kay, Director of the Office of Compliance and Field Operations. Each commissioner will have five minutes for questions to the extent that Commissioners need additional rounds, uh, we will allow for that. And after the questions are complete, staff will be excused and we'll turn to consideration of the package. As a reminder, it's not appropriate to discuss any legal advice given to us to, by the Office of General Counsel in public session. Legal advice must remain confidential. So I'm gonna start with myself. Beyond the thanks that I've given all of you, uh, I have no questions. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Schlick, I, I'd like to, Start by first thanking you for uh, and, and all of you uh, for your work on the operating plan. Uh, I know that this was a team effort, and I'd, I'd like you to pass on my appreciation uh, to, to everybody under you that, that that also worked to put together uh, this operating plan um, for that and for everything that they do on behalf of American consumers and in support of our safety mission. Um, to my question, one of the amendments that I'm offering today would direct. Uh, uh, the executive director to designate a formal liaison to improve our coordination with the state attorneys general. Uh, I believe that there is some agreement on the commission that we can do more with respect to our section 24 authorities. Uh, but in the course of discussing this amendment with my colleagues, uh, the question came up about what additional resources might we, we might be able to provide to states in terms of expertise. Uh, the amendment, as it's currently drafted, calls for the executive director to report back to the commission about the feasibility of compiling a litigation toolkit. Uh, in my mind, there are a number of forms that that could take, uh, including making available historical complaints and sa as, uh, as sample pleadings, uh, or it could be more involved like a practice guide. Uh, we want to be respectful, uh, respectful of staff resources. Uh, and the bottom line, I, I think, is that in directing this work, uh, I want the work product to be something that's useful and that would encourage state attorneys general to, uh, to, to get even more on the field to complement the work that our compliance enforcement and litigation team is doing. Um, in asking what's feasible, it's, it's my hope that the uh, re reply would would uh, be more than simply that uh, that none of this is feasible. So uh, I, I want to ask directly, 
uh, what what you think a, a litigation toolkit might look like, and whether or not you plan to support uh, uh, consult with uh, uh, the National Association of Attorneys General uh, and 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 perhaps AGs themselves uh, to to see what might be most helpful. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, after your questions a few weeks ago at the briefing, we did discuss among staff uh, how we might approach that if the commission directs it. And uh, we decided that the most likely home for that project would be in the Office of Compliance and Field Operations. So I'm going to ask Director Kay to, to answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the liaison would uh, likely establish some kind of web page portal um, that would be, uh, you know, accessible uh, to or, or visible to the states, uh, you know, where we could place uh, information about CPSA, Section 24, uh, case law, and other, you know, uh, documents related to state actions uh, that have involved CPSC or involved CPSC issues. Uh, I expect we likely would reach out to the state's attorneys general. We would post any letter that we send to that and coordinate with NAG uh, as we go forward. Okay, that's great. I appreciate that response. Thank you very much. Commissioner Trump, could you have any questions? I just wanted to thank each of you for being here this morning and being prepared to answer questions. Um, I, I have none. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll add my voice uh, to thank you all. I appreciate everything that you do, and I look forward to working with you in the next fiscal year. Mr. Ziak? Uh, no questions, but I would like to thank the leadership teams we have at the table, as well as our rank and file members here at uh, our headquarters at 5RP, and equally important uh, across the country uh, who may be watching this today. Thank you. Hearing no further questions, staff is excused, and we're going to turn to consideration of the operating plan itself. Um, before pointing this matter as proposed by the staff to a vote, I'm going to entertain any motions from commissioners to amend the staff proposal. Each commissioner, as a reminder, will be recognized to introduce their motion or amendment for up to three minutes. Uh, if the amendment is seconded, other commissioners rec will be recognized in order of their seniority. We'll have five minutes to ask questions of, of the commissioner. Uh, making the amendment or to provide comments on the amendment and multiple rounds will be allowed as necessary. I'm going to begin with a motion of my own, which is directing staff to make technical and conforming changes to the operating plan to reflect several organizational changes we approved by ballot in October. This includes moving the small business ombudsman and the consumer ombudsman to the office of communications and renaming some offices. Do I have a second? Second. second. Having heard a second, we're now going to turn to consideration of this motion, and um, I turn to my colleagues, Commissioner Felden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I intend to support this motion. Commissioner Tonka? Also support. Thanks. Commissioner Ball? I will as well. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Ziak? I also support this. I appreciate the support for the motion. I'm going to move to consideration of the motion, um, calling on people to vote. Uh, Commissioner Feldman? I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Zia? Yes. And I vote yes as well. The yeses are five, the noes are zero. The amendment is adopted. Uh, those are all of my motions. So next going in order, seniority, Commissioner Feldman, do you have any motions or amendments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I have five amendments that I'd like to call up in turn. Um, Starting with Commissioner Feldman one, I assume? Uh, Feldman Ziak one, uh, yeah. uh, and I'll, I'll talk for a little bit about it and then, and then ask for a second. Um, uh, Feldman Ziak one uh, is the amendment that I just spoke about regarding uh, the the creation of the state attorney general liaison. Uh, Section twenty four uh, of our statute provides an important second layer of consumer protection by authorizing state attorneys general to litigate regulatory violations, sale of recalled good cases, and other violations. Uh, it's an important force multiplier, and I believe we can do more to get states on the field. Uh, when I travel for, for work, I make a point to visit with State AG's office to discuss our shared mission on behalf of consumers. Uh, in my time as commissioner, I've had the opportunity to meet with a, a number of AG offices across the country, and all of these meetings have uh, a similar theme. Excitement about Section 24 and questions about how state AGs can better collaborate with CPSC to bring cases. Uh, I, I'm encouraged to see that more states are, are active in this space, for example, 
earlier this year, the Washington State Attorney General received national attention for obtaining a fine and a legally binding resolution against a large national retailer uh, for lead and uh, heavy metals and toys. Uh, just last week in Indiana, uh, the AG there highlighted uh, recalled consumer products as part of his Halloween messaging. So clearly there's an appetite uh, for this activity. Uh, with this increased interest, I think it's time that CPSC established uh, a liaison to coordinate with state AGs. Uh, this amendment would direct the executive director and the general counsel to identify a liaison and report back to the commission about best practices uh, and possible next steps. I, I want to thank Commissioner Ziak for his work with me uh, to, to bring this amendment forward. And I'll, I'll, I'll let him speak for that as we worked on the dais. Uh, but for now, I, I believe that uh, uh, this is an amendment that would increase consumer safety throughout the country, and uh, I, I would ask for my colleague's support. Is there a second? Second. Hearing a second, we'll now turn to consideration of the amendment, um, starting with myself uh, for five minutes. Uh, I do plan to support this amendment. State attorneys generals are important defenders of consumers, uh, consumer protections. You know, fortunately, CPSC statute, as you noted, does recognize a potentially powerful role for state AGs to enforce federal product safety laws as a complement to CPSC's enforcement work. Um, I appreciate the, the amendment and exploring ways to empower the state AGs. And I also appreciate that the amendment directs staff to provide a plan to the commission for its con consideration. Given the tight budget that we're facing, I want to understand the resources that are needed to be devoted here and whether it impacts um, compliance's ability to continue their own vigorous enforcement or activities. Uh, with that, I will be supporting it. And Commissioner Trumka. Uh, I'm also pleased to support this amendment. State AGs are powerhouses of delivering consumer protection results for their citizens, and that may take on outsized importance now. Uh, I'm a bit biased there as a former Maryland AAG in the Consumer Protection Division, but I saw firsthand the dedicated people in those roles that are always looking for new ways to keep people safe. We should be helping them and letting them help us. So I support the amendment. Mr. Ball. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I also will be supporting the amendment. I look forward to hearing uh, about staff's plan and how they plan to implement it. I think I've shared with Commissioner Feldman and Commissioner Ziak that this is not a new idea in the sense that uh, uh, we have looked at this uh, from the agency perspective. We have participated. I personally uh, was on staff and participated in those meetings, and I hope that this next um, uh, review uh, of and development of a plan uh, can bear more fruit than we have in the past. So I do plan to support the amendment. Thank you. Commissioner Ziak. Thank you. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, uh, many of the points I was going to make were touched on already. I'm pleased to co-sponsor this amendment, which arises out of the various trips that uh, Commissioner Feldman and I have taken, both with me as his staffer and, and in my current role. Uh, state AGs are a force multiplier. And as Commissioner Trumpka noted, they are very uh, well attuned to consumer pro or consumer uh, issues in their states. And I appreciate my colleague's support of the amendment. Mr. Feldman, did you have any concluding comments? Uh, again, I appreciate my colleague's support on this amendment. We're now going to move to a vote on the amendment. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. I vote yes. Commissioner Trumpka. Yes. Commissioner Boyle. Yes. Commissioner Ziak. Yes. And I vote yes as well. That makes the yes is five, the no is zero. And the amendment by Commissioner Feldman Ziak is adopted. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, did you have another amendment? Uh, yes, I'd like to call up uh, and introduce Feldman Ziak two uh, with respect to e-commerce enforcement. Please describe the amendment. This amendment largely reflects work that I understand the commission's already doing. In September, Commissioner Ziak and I called on commission staff to evaluate emerging e-commerce platforms to determine how. Uh, these firms are uh, that, that rely on overseas suppliers are meeting their obligations under the Consumer Product Safety Act. Uh, over the summer, uh, three commissioners specifically mentioned in our testimony before Congress the importance of keeping up with new online marketplaces. Uh, I think uh, we've been clear about how important we believe this issue is for the health and safety of American consumers. Uh, the operating plan is an opportunity for the commission to state explicitly that uh, that this is a, a commission priority activity. Uh, that's exactly what this amendment does. We expect staff to continue its assessment of the business operations of e-commerce platforms, including emerging marketplaces whose practices we frankly know 
so little about to assure compliance with CPSC statutory and regulatory obligations. And we expect staff to conduct targeting initiatives, sampling and evaluation of products from international e-commerce platforms that distribute retail or manufacture consumer products to identify uh, violations for enforcement actions. I'd like to thank uh, again, Commissioner Ziak for his co-sponsorship of this amendment and for his dedication to aggressive enforcement against overseas firms that sell deadly products to American families. Mr. Chairman, I, I would uh, ask for my colleague's support on this amendment. Is there a second? Second. Hearing second, we'll now turn to consideration of the amendment. Um, I can start with myself. Uh, claiming five minutes. Uh, Commissioner Feldman and Ziak, uh, the work you describe, as you just said yourself, uh, is largely being done by the enforcement team already, but I have no concerns about recognizing it more specifically in the operating plan. And it takes me back, it was actually my first speech as chair of the, as the CPSC that I highlighted the need for the agency to focus on e-commerce and really the need for online platforms to, to step up on their own and ensure products offered on their sites are safe for consumers. Since then, the agency has uh, increased its resources in addressing e-commerce um, product, uh, product safety issues. And even in the short time I've been here, the marketplace is involved with the growth of international online marketplaces selling directly to, to Americans and advertising on the Super Bowl. Um, I'm glad that we're all be, going to be able to speak on this and hopefully have one voice on about these important issues, and I plan to support the amendment. Commissioner uh, Trumka, do you have any comments? Um, you know, this, this commission has sent a clear message that e-commerce enforcement is a top priority uh, and needs to be staffs already doing that work and already prioritizing it, but it can never hurt to make that priority abundantly clear to all. So I do support the amendment. Commissioner Boyle, do you have any comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I plan to support the amendment. Commissioner Ziak, do you have a comment? Uh, I, I'm happy to have co-sponsored this amendment. And as others have said, I think, uh, Working on e-commerce issues is a priority that I've heard from everyone sitting up here today. E-commerce is increasingly the preferred method for American consumers to purchase products they use every day. Given this 21st century reality, the commission must and is focusing our efforts on e-commerce, which present new and different risks than we are used to, uh, to American consumers. So thank you for your support. Commissioner Feldman, did you have any closing thoughts? Uh, just to thank my colleagues for their support. So I'm going to now move to a vote on the amendment. Commissioner Feldman, how do you vote? I vote yes. Commissioner Chomka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. And I vote yes as well. The yeses are fives and noes are zero and the amendment by Commissioners Feldman and Ziak is adopted. You have another amendment? I do, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce Feldman Ziak 3 regarding enforcement target financial verifications. Please describe the amendment. The purpose of this amendment is to provide verifiable evidence of the financial conditions of firms that assert an ability an inability to pay defense during negotiations with our teams. Uh, when the commission is considering a proposed corrective action plan, it's not uncommon for agency staff to report back to the commission that a recalling firm is seeking relief from certain remedies, including refunds. Likewise, when staff is presents a, a proposed civil penalty uh, settlement agreement, a firm might assert that it lacks the means to pay the full amount. Uh, there are legitimate instances where this might be true, but for too long, uh, the commission has accepted uh, a firm's representations as accurate uh, without verification. Uh, this amendment would make clear to firms that the commission is willing to listen to legitimate arguments about financial hardship, but we're not gonna take their unverified word for it. Specifically, this uh, amendment would direct staff to present evidence of a financial condition of any firm asserting an inability to pay defense against requested remedies and civil penalty assessments. Uh, that could include audited financial statements, tax returns, or other uh, official documents. Uh, the mere claim itself will no longer be sufficient. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, believe that uh, uh, the, the provisions here would uh, uh, include information about parent companies and subsidiaries and, and other affiliated uh, entities as appropriate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second for the motion? Second. Having heard a second, we're going to turn to consideration of the moment uh, amendment. Uh, I'm going to start with myself. Uh, so, Commissioner Feldman, Commissioner Ziak, I do want to thank you for your work with my team on the amendment. I do understand your desire to get relevant financial information from companies 
in order to make informed decision about certain caps and civil penalty doors. I just wanted to make sure that compliance was still able to move quickly so that recalls that are, are not unnecessarily delayed uh, where finance is not an issue. Um, so I appreciate working together to get where we are and having reached a reasonable place in this amendment. I'm comfortable supporting it. Commissioner Trumka. Yeah, if, if a company's pleading poverty to secure or reduce civil penalty or recall remedy, they better be able to prove it. So I support the, the uh, amendment. Commissioner Blum. I will be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Commissioner Zia. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to co-sponsor this amendment with Commissioner Feldman. This amendment will ensure that the commission has that full picture of an entity's financial situation, including its parents and subsidiaries, when it claims an inability to pay either a fine or proceed with a recall. I think it's important for the commission to send the message that these requests are coming from the commission and not from staff. And so that is one of the, the purposes of this amendment. And I believe ultimately this will save time uh, on the back end and ensure uh, where we pursue payment when feasible and the commission doesn't have to request this information and delay either uh, civil penalty agreements or uh, recall, uh, 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 implementing recalls. Thank you. Mr. Fellow, did you have any final comments? No, just that I appreciate all the comments of uh, my, my colleagues have offered today. At this point in time, we're going to turn to a vote on the amendment. Commissioner Pellman, how do you vote? I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So the yeses are five, the noes are zero, and the amendment by Commissioner Pellman Ziak is adopted. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, do you have another amendment? Mr. Chairman, we're getting there. Uh, I'd like to call up uh, Feldman ZX4 uh, with respect to firms in call incurring the cost of recall translations. Please describe the amendment. This amendment is all about fairness. The commission using the resources entrusted to us by the American taxpayer should not be on the hook for the costs of translating recall documents into other languages. Those costs are properly incurred by the recalling firm itself. This amendment would realign the cost of recall translations consistent with the requirements of our statute and regulations. Obviously, we are concerned about translation accuracy and this amendment speaks to that too. I recognize that this has been an issue that my colleague Commissioner Boyle in particular cares about. Uh, it's my understanding that she will offer a, a, another translation amendment today, which I also plan to support. I view these two translation amendments as complementary and appreciate the robust discussion that we've had with agency staff about how to rethink our recall translations to ensure not only that we're protecting American consumers in all communities, uh, but that we're spending taxpayer resources uh, uh, responsibly and efficiently. This amendment would be a step towards both of these goals, and I, I thank my colleagues for their consideration. I'd also like to thank Commissioner Ziak for his strong support of this proposal uh, and his work on the amendment. Uh, I know that uh, he'll have his own words uh, as, as uh, we work down the dais, but uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I would welcome the support of, of, of my colleagues and I yield the balance of my time. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we're not going to move to consideration of the amendment. Um, starting with myself, it is critical that we use every tool in our toolbox to get safety information out to all Americans, regardless of the language that they primarily speak. Um, this has been a priority, as you noted, for Commissioner Boyle, and I appreciate you joining her in the efforts to tr look for creative solutions to ensure that recalls are translated into language which is of the, that the consumers are uh, of the consumers who are using the products themselves. You know, while I support this amendment, um, I do appreciate also that this is to direct the staff to develop a plan that will be presented to the commission because uh, I think it is very complex issues associated with this as to both, as you pointed out, the accuracy and um, how this would go out and the reliance that the commission can take uh, without our doing our own diligence on uh, the language that, that is translated. Um, given the majority of the volunteers are, recall, uh, are voluntary, the firms would also have to agree to these translations and we need to make sure that they are accurate and timely and have uh, something in place for firms that refuse to, to agree to these translations. Um, we're doing that in Spanish currently. I think we need to make sure that that, that continues at the, at the very least. Um, your amendment calls for staff to present a sort of plan, which is the right thing to do. And I'm interested in seeing what staff is able to put together and hope they would take these uh, considerations of accuracy and timeliness into consideration. I uh, do plan to support the, the amendment and look forward to reviewing the plan. Commissioner Tronka. Thank you. Uh, a, a year ago, I proposed an amendment that passed unanimously and became part of the 2024 op plan. 
and it added as a priority activity for our compliance team to quote, encourage commitments from recalling firms to communicate recall information to consumers in Spanish and additional languages commonly spoken in the United States. And the amendment required staff to report periodically on the results of those efforts. Um, I've seen no evidence that firms took on that responsibility. And it's only fair that those who cause the problem devote the proper resources to making sure that their end users can hear and understand the safety message that is being conveyed. So clearly something more formal is needed than what we approved last year. And I hope that passing an amendment on this topic two years in a row sends a clear message that we expect this problem to be fixed. So I support the amendment. Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will also be supporting the amendment. I look forward to uh, getting staff's plan and hope it, it will be one that we can execute and implement quickly. Thank you. Commissioner Ziak. Uh, in the interest of brevity, I will first associate myself with all of Commissioner Feldman's remarks about the uh, stewardship and, and the effort we're trying to, to extend in terms of getting messaging out. I also, too, wish to recognize Commissioner Boyle's work on translations and I know, as, as Commissioner Feldman mentioned, she is offering an amendment that I also intend to support. So thank you for your work on that. Commissioner Feldman, do you have any final thoughts? In my remarks, I recognized Commissioner Boyle's work on on the uh, the, the the topic. Uh, I, I should also recognize the good work that Commissioner Trumpka has also done on this issue. Uh, and I thank everybody for uh, their their stated support of the amendment. At this time, we're going to move to consideration uh, voting on the amendment. Um, Commissioner Feldman? I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. And I vote yes as well. That means there are five yeses, zero noes, and the amendment by Commissioner Feldman and Ziak is adopted. Uh, do you have an additional amendment? Last but not least, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to speak about Feldman Ziak 5, strengthening nation to nation relationships. Please describe the amendment. During my tenure as commissioner, I have made tribal outreach a top priority. Last year, the commission launched a public health awareness campaign in 10 states with significant American Indian populations, as well as uh, in Alaska and Hawaii. The impetus for this campaign was a series of visits I made uh, a, year, a, year, a couple of years ago with uh, Commissioner Ziak to the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. Tribal leaders uh, help shape the commission's thinking on the need to communicate our safety messages more effectively. Uh, this communication is critical because we know that uh, unintentional injury mortality rates for American Indians and Alaska Natives are around two and a half times higher than that for Americans overall. In fact, unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death for American Indians and Alaska Natives between one and 44 years old. Uh, while productive, uh, the, the meetings that we have had with tribes have been limited without a formal process to ensure meaningful and timely input by tribal officials on agency business and pending matters. Uh, as an independent agency, we are encouraged uh, but not required to implement uh, Executive Order 13175 on consultation and coordination with Indian tribal governments. This amendment would direct a plan furthering the aims of this executive order, which provides a framework for federal agencies. Uh, it's past time that the, the agency had such a plan, and I would welcome my colleagues' consideration of this provision to recognize tribal sovereignty and improve engagement with the tribes. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we now move to consideration of the amendment. I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, first, I'd like to thank Commissioners Feldman and Ziak for their longstanding efforts to engage with and learn from uh, tribal communities. Their work to expand communications and outreach um, demonstrates their commitment to the agency's diversity and inclusion work. DEIA work has really been a priority of mine since I've been here as chair, and I'm grateful for that as bipartisan support of the CPSC. I support this amendment, which requires staff to put together uh, a plan for commission consideration to consider uh, regarding engagement with uh, American Indian and Alaska Native tribal nations and the resources it may take to establish the standards for dialogue, collaboration, exchange uh, with those tribal nations. Um, Native American outreach has been part of our safety program since I've arrived with the agency, and we need to ensure our message is effective in reaching tribal nations and that our efforts improve safety. Uh, I appreciate your dedication. At, and at reaching these communities and honestly in reaching all communities that are disproportionately impacted by uh, product hazards. Um, Commissioner Trumka. I support the development of appropriate ways to make sure the tribal nations are aware 
of the work that we're doing and have appropriate opportunities to share their viewpoints on matters that impact them. Commissioner Ball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will also be supporting this amendment, especially looking forward to staff's plan. Uh, and thank you for introducing it. Commissioner Ziak. Again, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I'm proud to co-sponsor this amendment, which as Commissioner Feldman uh, recognized is a reflection of not only our trip to the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming, but to Indian reservations across the Southwest and West. And we wanna continue that work. And this is work that's critical to the commission's work and mission. Uh, this amendment uh, will allow us to engage in a real two-way dialogue with the tribes in a way that we've not had to date. It's a step toward build, improving and building our efforts and outreach to tribes as we look to use the executive order as a guide to increasing those efforts with this particular community. Thank you for everyone's support. I, I do you have additional. I appreciate the the, the remarks and, and and the support. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to move to a vote on the amendment. Commissioner Feldman, I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka, yes. Commissioner uh, Boyle, yes. Commissioner Ziak, yes. And I vote yes as well. So the yeses are five, the noes are zero. The amendment uh, by Commissioner Feldman Ziak is adopted. Do you have another amendment, Mr. Chairman? I do not. All right. Hearing no more amendments from Commissioner Feldman, we now move. To Commissioner Trumka, do you have an amend any amendments? Uh, I do. I call up Trumka one. Can you describe Trumka one? Sure. Uh, with a budget as small as ours and a mission as big as ours, we need to shake the couch cushions to find all the loose change we can. And one area where we can save is by leveraging remote options to deliver the same services while saving on travel expenses. This mirrors the reasoning of the decision we've made for our employees to maintain our tremendously successful telework policies. This workforce continues to prove that it can get its work done anywhere while achieving record-breaking results. So this amendment would save the agency $88,000 on international travel and costs for foreign business training uh, on our laws in person. It still allows all 12 planned trainings to occur, but remotely. It was important for me to find a way for staff to cover just as much ground while cutting down on our expenses in this belt tightening environment. Staff will continue delivering on its important work to make sure that products coming into our country comply with our rules because that can help keep us safe. Likewise, our staff works every day to improve the safety of consumer products by helping industry set their voluntary standards. This amendment will also maintain the strength of that work while encouraging voluntary standards bodies to maintain virtual meeting options instead of eliminating them. And it empowers staff to make the decision whether they see added value in, a, in attending in person or if they can accomplish their goals remotely, saving them time on, uh, to work on other pressing matters and saving money for this agency. Thank you. Is there a second for the amendment? Second. Having heard a second, we're now. Mr. Not Chairman, excuse me, I have an amendment to the amendment. Uh, is this the appropriate time to introduce? Is the appropriate that? time to a second degree amendment? Okay, I, uh, I ask uh, my staff to. So for those reminder, for those doing a second degree amendment, um, it's consideration of the second degree amendment. Similarly, like we would do for, for the amendment, um, if the second degree amendment is adopted, then that would become the text of the amendment that we're considering under the, the uh, Trumka amendment. So can you describe your uh, second degree amendment. Yes, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the purpose of my amendment is to account for the entire 150,975,000 operating plan allocation set forth in budget table two and to achieve transparency in how agency funds will be used by agency staff. My amendment would amend the Trumka amendment so that the text on page OS 11 would read as follows. In the budget table row for international programs, replace 290 with 202 and transfer 88 to the Office of Compliance and Field Operations. I think this amendment is necessary to cure an accounting gap in Trumpka Amendment 1, which seeks to eliminate funding from one program office without designating an alternative program to receive those funds. On one level, this is basic accounting. When you subtract funds from a total that remains constant, those funds need to be reflected somewhere. There is no general operating fund set forth in table, Budget Table 2 to absorb these funds. And so for basic accounting and transparency purposes, when we are proposing cuts, we should also be providing offsetting spending proposals to balance the books, so to speak. 
But the bigger picture for me as a commissioner, other than having the numbers add up, which is an important goal in and of itself, is setting policy direction in the operating plan. That is why we are here today, to provide policy direction for how dollars are to be spent. To be clear, my policy preference is to preserve funds in the International Programs Office, given that it is already absorbing a $224,000 cut, a 44% decrease from last year. However, my amendment is designed to provide policy direction if that cut prevails. I propose transferring the funds to the Office of Compliance for a number of reasons. One of my top priorities has been to ensure the vigorous enforcement of our laws, and this transfer would support that priority. Under the OP plan, as proposed, the Office of Compliance has been cut by $133,000. Transferring these funds to compliance will restore about two-thirds of that funding. Transferring $88,000 back to compliance will not make that office whole, but it will help bolster its important work. I thank my colleagues for considering my amendment. Is there a second for the amendment? Second. Having heard a second, we're now going to turn to consideration of the amendment. I'm going to start with myself. Um, I appreciate Commissioner Boyle's um, uh, second degree amendment. And from an accounting perspective, I understand completely why uh, if money is taken away, we need to look at the underlying base. That being said, I really can't support Trump, uh, Commissioner Trumka's first amendment. So I, um, uh, it's hard for me to support something that would uh, even improve the amendment that's out there. But I totally understand where you're coming from. Commissioner Feldman, did you have comments? Uh, I don't at this time. I'm I'm reading this language for the for the first time. Uh, I I appreciate. Uh, I think the um, intent behind this language, but uh, uh, I'll, I'm going to defer on comments as I as I read through the language in front of me. Thank you, Commissioner Trumka. Did you have comments? Or questions? Well, just a process question. Is there a vote on this amendment to the amendment and then a vote on the amendment either as amended or unamended? Those so, two separate votes? So there's two separate votes. There will be a vote on the second degree amendment. If the second degree amendment succeeds, that will replace or in this case add on to the language of your amendment. And that would be what is then being considered in another round for consideration and voting. If the second degree fails, then there is no change to your amendment, and that would be uh, under consideration and a separate vote will happen on that amendment. As to the comment, if this is where funds end up, that would be a fine spot for them. Um, but I think we're in an uncertain budget picture and specifically directing them is something that I avoided intentionally because we don't know where we're going to need to direct funds in the coming months. So I won't support the amendment to my amendment. Commissioner. Ziak, do you have uh, comments or questions? Well, like Commissioner Feldman, I'm seeing this for the first time. Uh, I'll reserve comment for now. Having reserved comment, turn back to Commissioner Boyle if you have any closing thoughts. No, I just, uh, again, uh, it's basic accounting. If we're taking money from one line, it has to be reflected somewhere else. So uh, the idea that it, uh, we're reserving where it's going to be spent isn't consistent with the document that we're approving, which has a specific number that we're approving. So, uh, and I, I just think it has to go somewhere. And so I am, uh, my, as I say, a priority of mine is enforcement and compliance. Uh, and uh, that's why we're here today to uh, express our policy direction to staff. So uh, it, to me, it's a really basic accounting, but I appreciate everybody's comments. Thank you. Sorry, did you, I was gonna turn to a vote on the second degree amendment? Turn to a vote on the second degree amendment. Um, Commissioner Feldman, how do you vote? Uh, I vote no, I'm comfortable with the amendment uh, Trumpka one as drafted. Commissioner Trumpka, how do you vote? I vote no. Commissioner Boyle, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Siak, how do you vote? Uh, this, uh, for the record, is a very challenging vote because I understand both perspectives. Uh, I do think it is uh, prudent to allow uh, for money in an uncertain fiscal environment. We're operating under a continuing resolution and, and likely will be for some time. That said, I also appreciate the desire to make sure that money is accounted for uh, 
I will therefore support the amendment. Um, comes to, to me, I mean, I think it goes back to what I said before. I have fundamental problems with the uh, amendment, uh, Commissioner Trumka's amendment, which is being amended by this. Um, the transfer of funds doesn't actually, um, well, from a from an accounting perspective, makes a lot of sense. From an improvement of the amendment perspective, does not make uh, it any better for me. Um, and uh, I'm not looking to improve the amendment. I am looking to, in the end of the day, I would urge my colleagues to vote against Commissioner Trumka's amendment, which I will talk about more later. So I'm voting against uh, against it. So against the second degree amendment, which means that we have. Two votes for three votes against the amendment that fails, and I would ask if, any, if there are any additional second degree amendments to the Trumpka amendment. Hearing no second degree amendments to the Trumpka amendment, we'll turn to consideration of the Trumpka amendment as drafted by Commissioner Trumpka. Um, I will recognize myself for five minutes, and as I said, I this amendment really is bad policy. Um, I can't support this amendment. There are three elements to this amendment. Really, there's a $88,000 cut to international programs budget. Second, there's a prohibition on in-person international trainings for industry. And third, there's a direction to staff that will uh, promote the minimization of travel to voluntary standards meetings. I believe each of these independently is a bad policy and putting them together, the amendment will result in more hazardous products being manufactured and imported into consumers homes. It's a terrible outcome for consumers and a terrible outcome for our staff. This amendment would result in a cut to international programs that is far too severe. In a scheme in the federal uh, budget, $88,000 may not sound like much, but for a small office and a small agency it can be vital. In drafting the op plan before, staff already proposed a steep cut in the budget of international programs, decreasing its budget by 44%. And over the past year, the office staff has been reduced by two FTE, and those are big hits. Yet this amendment would cut uh, the bare bones budget even further, resulting in a 61% cut to international programs since last year. Now, CPSC's mission is to protect American consumers from unreasonable risks of injury and death associated with consumer products. We do that through a tiered system of regulation, education, uh, and enforcement. And the best way to protect consumers is to work with manufacturers to build safe products that meet U.S. standards. Now, of course, when a company fails to meet our standards, we do have inspectors at the ports of entry but with approximately a trillion dollars in consumer product imports each year, the chance of us catching every violation of a product is incredibly small, despite the best effort of our port staff. Our last line of defense is to conduct safety recalls and issue warnings when we identify a violative product that's been sold in the U.S. But that means dangerous products have already made it into consumers' homes. And we recognize the struggle of the low recall response rates and too many hazards remain in consumers' homes even after a recall. So that goes back again. The best way to prevent the deaths and injuries that we see from consumers' products is to make sure that the defective products are not manufactured in the first place. And that's what international programs training is all about, making sure that companies are in compliance with our safety laws and don't violate U.S. standards. The in-person trainings are critical because we need to go where the products are being made, the ones that the American consumers are buying. According to recent data, about 34% were made in China, about 13% in Mexico, and about 14% combined from Vietnam and Taiwan. China, the 34% number, is a primary supplier of toys, textiles and electronic products to the U.S. Now, my colleagues may argue that we can do these trainings by webinar, but that is not true for Chinese manufacturers. China has put its companies behind a firewall. They cannot access our regulatory robot or the webinars that we're presenting in the United States. But the demand and the desire for education on how to comply with our standard is strong. Just last year, international programs did a 
in-person training in China, in which more than 150 stakeholders participated in person, and more than 4,000 participated remotely. Now, remotely because our folks were behind the Chinese firewall at the time, and they were able to access that training remotely. As a result, thousands of companies were educated on our laws and how to comply with them. Even for the countries where trainings can be done remotely, there's great value in in-person trainings. And I think all of us recognize that. We know how interpersonal engagements are important and what happens after a presentation can be just as important as if we were listening to the lecture itself. This allows for questions, extended interactions with our staff to be able to explain exactly how manufacturers should be building to meet our safety standards and what the consequences are for failing to meet those standards, which turns to our enforcement side of things. That, that isn't impossible. That's not possible in online trainings and in webinars. This type of effective safety education is what the CPSC should be encouraging, not prohibiting in an operating plan. I see that my time is up, so I'm going to go to the next round and allow my colleagues have time to, to make their comments. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate my colleagues work on this provision and I, I do intend to support it. Uh, I, I also appreciate the, uh, the hard work of our staff, including uh, our Office of International Programs and many of the arguments that, that you just laid out, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but, but I have been skeptical about expanding commission, uh, expanding commission resources on in-person trainings in countries that frankly don't respect our laws. There may be some value to these trainings, but none that we can quantify. I appreciate the savings this amendment will provide. These funds could partially offset the cost of additional field personnel to strengthen our presence uh, in southern border states, specifically in Texas and California. Uh, these funds could be put towards research to improve the data that we rely on in rulemakings and, and in other areas, as Commissioner Boyle uh, uh, proposed. Uh, these funds could go towards compliance, which I'd also support. Uh, the bottom line is that we'll have options, and I think that's a good thing in our current budget environment. I take Commissioner Boyle's comments about accounting accuracy to heart, um, and if there's additional technical or conforming changes that are needed, uh, I'm, I'm prepared to support those. Uh, if necessary, in terms of compiling a final draft. Uh, but in terms of the, off the, the savings offsets, I, I might have gone even further because I can't say for certain whether these trainings work, uh, nor can I justify these specific expenditures to American taxpayers. So I, I thank my colleague, Commissioner Trumpka, for the amendment, and I yield the balance of my time. Commissioner Boyle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to respond to my colleague, Commissioner Feldman, in terms of the technical amendment, the reason I didn't offer that is that there is no general operating fund in, uh, set forth in Budget Table 2. Uh, and so um, just uh, I'm not sure there is such a, an avenue. So I will just leave that out there uh, and turn to uh, the uh, uh, Trump Amendment 1. Um, I oppose this amendment for a number of reasons. First, I want to associate myself with the comments of the chair, especially regarding the impact on international programs, which has already been cut significantly. I think this amendment sends the wrong message about the obligation we have to use all of the two tools available to us to protect the American consumer. For me, that includes engaging as effectively as possible in all venues, including the international arena. The fact of the matter is that the American people spend billions of dollars each year purchasing goods from overseas. Doing everything we can to make sure those products are safe is central to what we do. Having our staff educate foreign entities is but one element of an overall strategy, including preventing violative products from entering our ports to protect consumers. I also believe that there is genuine value in conducting in-person trainings and meetings. And while I certainly recognize the strides we have made in conducting CPSC business in virtual environments, I reject the idea that all of our work can always be accomplished just as effectively through purely online interactions. Indeed, all of the commissioners on this dais have recognized the value that in-person opportunities afford, as our travel logs will amply demonstrate. I personally have traveled to meet with staff at the ports, 
I've spoken in a national conference on drowning prevention and spoken to industry representatives about possible regulatory options for e-bikes. I know you, Commissioner Trumka, have traveled to Miami and New York and Detroit and Baltimore. I trust these have been valuable experiences for you. I would not want to place unnecessary restrictions on our staff, restrictions that we do not impose on ourselves that may interfere with the successful implementation of their mission just because their mission involves engagement with overseas stakeholders. I would also note that I do not have any information that explains the basis for the $88,000 figure referenced in the amendment. $88,000 may be the cost of travel, I don't know, but it is not clear to me what level of funds will be needed to execute the mission of, of that office in lieu of travel. None of that has been spelled out for me. For that reason, I intend to revisit this issue at mid-year to get an accounting of how funds are being spent compared to what we have authorized here today, not just for our international programs, but for all of the programs set forth in budget table two of the operating plan. Specifically, I will be asking staff to provide a report comparing the projected funding and FTE levels on table two with what the agency has actually funded to date in FY25. Not having visibility into actual spending broken down by each program area prevents the commission from, from fulfilling its obligation to provide clear policy direction. Today's discussion on deleting $88,000 without explaining the basis for that figure or identifying a corresponding program to fund at a higher level highlights for me that we do not have that visibility. I strongly oppose this amendment. Commissioner Zia. Thank you. Uh, I commend Commissioner Trumpka for providing an amendment to, to me that makes good fiscal sense, and I will support it. Chair Honserik, I appreciate your opposition to this amendment and the conversations we had about those concerns. Sometimes I've learned in my time as a Senate staffer, honest people can disagree on issues. And fortunately, this is the case here. Let me be clear on one thing. This is not a concern with our staff's work in the international programs area. This is a concern about the foreign company's seriousness in their compliance efforts. You mentioned China's firewall. In my mind, that speaks perfectly to the issue. There are no firewalls on the United States side, and a Chinese, foreign, Chinese companies and other foreign companies, for that matter, can come to the U.S. to learn in person if they want to speak to our staff. While I appreciate the chair's position regarding in-person training, I am skeptical that these trainings have the measurable success and quantifiable results that justify the travel. Moreover, I believe this, this amendment will eventually allow us to redirect the funds from the programs, from programs that do not have demonstrated, that have not demonstrated measurable success and quantifiable results. I uh, will uh, yield the balance of my time in the interest of time, but thank you. Or I start my next round. I don't know, Commissioner Trump, if you wanted to respond back or do you want me to go to. Yeah, I'm happy to reserve until the end of the rounds. So going starting another round of five minutes. Um, going back to my fundamental premise, which is the best way for us to protect the American consumer is not to have uh, dangerous products manufactured in the first place. You know, if we can stop million, 10 million defective products from being made. That's far more effective than trying to stop them at the ports or to have them being recalled. Now, I recognize you're saying that you don't feel that there is evidence of being successful. And, you know, I went back and I wanted to see, uh, can this be successful and, and what are we looking at? First, I find it hard to believe that companies are showing up for trainings, whether it's in China or, or other countries who are doing this, spending their time, spending money, to simply ignore what they hear. When I don't want to pay attention to something, I don't bother to show up in the first place. Um, second, I asked, I went back to take a look at the companies who have been trained by international programs in the past few years. I also looked to see our uh, NOVs, which are publicly posted. I looked at the number of NOVs since 2018, it's been a, almost 16,000 of them. Of that, you know, who's not on the list? Any of the foreign companies that have been trained by our international programs. All those companies are not on that list of NOVs. I'm not saying that they 
we'll never create a violet product. All I'm saying is those companies took the training and they're not on the list to date. There are a lot of companies, 16,000 approximately, that are on that list. And honestly, a bunch of them are American companies too. That's what the small business ombudsman is for, to try and educate those companies. And they do that in person. They've gone to Ohio to visit Amish furniture makers because in person is a way that they can reach that community. We need to go where the companies are and to be able to provide them with the information, both about what the standards are and also what the consequences for failing to comply are. Um, it's really arbitrary in my mind to prohibit in-person trainings, to micromanage and diminish this department's ability to do its job, which has been doing excellent work. Approving this amendment would place off limits of staff, uh, limits on our staff that will undermine product safety in the United States. And I also believe it's internally inconsistent. The amendment still allows international programs to travel for inter, uh, intergovernmental business, which is also critically important for this agency and the work that we do for the American people. But in doing that, it prohibits the staff from training foreign man manufacturers as an additional activity during those same, same trips. They could be in the next room. They can't tell them how to make their product safer. They'll have to come back to the United States to be able to do a webinar and hope those people then participate in the webinar. It's a missed opportunity for an efficient use of our limited resources. I also have concerns about the, the voluntary standards language. I think it raises a negative, uh, sends a, a negative signal to staff regarding in-person attendance at voluntary standards meetings. I I associate myself with the desire the standard meetings should have a virtual options, but staff shouldn't have to second guess whether it's absolutely necessary for them to attend a particular meeting. Placing constraints on staff participation is counterproductive. CPSC should be taking a leadership role in voluntary standards work, as we've been doing for many, many years. We should be providing safety data to stakeholders and using every opportunity to address unreasonable risks of injury and death through voluntary standards process. If the meeting is important and the staff thinks that their presence may advance safety, there should be no doubt in my mind that they should take the opportunity to be there. I fear that as a result of this amendment, our first line of defense for American consumers is going to be crippled. Foreign companies that want to comply with U.S. standards will end up producing defective products because we're not there to educate them. Dangerous products are going to end up in consumers' homes and that we could have stopped at the source. And voluntary standards efforts will be slower and less effective because of this amendment. If I can't convince my colleagues today, I will work to build a, a stronger argument and, as Commissioner Boyle said, revisit this issue in the mid-year. Um, I also urge stakeholders to weigh in with the Commission as well. Over the years, I've heard from both consumer groups and industry praising the work of international programs and the importance of the activities of CPSC and the voluntary standards work. And we need to hear from you. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. That I turn to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, again, uh, with respect to the work that international programs does, uh, I, I believe that that is an office that does do good work to advance this agency's safety mission. I would uh, associate myself with uh, Commissioner Zx comments uh, that I, I, I don't believe anything in this amendment is is designed to to undercut uh, uh, the, the 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 work and the dedication of the staff on uh, on the the EXIP team. Um, but the the comment was just made that uh, that that this amendment would undermine safety in the United States. Um, I, I don't know how we can say that without any quantifiable. Uh, uh, certainty about the safety benefits that the, the trainings, uh, the in-person trainings uh, that that uh, uh, we currently conduct pr provide. I heard the number uh, a million to ten million additional violative products uh, on the horizon. Should this amendment carry, uh, I, I don't know what basis that amendment has uh, th that that figure has uh, in in terms of um, in in terms of uh, its accuracy uh, because it's just not something that that we're currently tracking. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the quantifiable uh, r result that the, 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 the trainings uh, provide. Uh, I yield the balance of my time. I, 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 I do intend to support this amendment. Commissioner Boyle. I don't have any further comments. Thank you. 
Where should you uh, thank you. I, I do appreciate the passion. And again, again, this is an issue in which we simply disagree. Uh, in, in terms of the, the numbers you, you discussed, I think my concern has remained, and I mentioned this during the staff briefing, uh, you've got a correlation causation issue there. Again, to me, we've not demonstrated that these programs and the recipients of these programs are directly affected in terms of their conduct. That may be true, and I remain open to revisiting that in the future, but at this point, that direct correlation our causation rather does not exist. Uh, um, I also wanted to, to, to discuss, because I do think this is an important bifurcation. Uh, you mentioned government to government outreach. I think that's different than government or government to company outreach. And that is one of the reasons I appreciate Commissioner Trumka's bifurcation of that. Government to government outreach, discussing with countries that share our values in terms of consumer safety is critical to sharing information, to sharing enforcement efforts. And I'm glad that those efforts will continue. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Trumpka, did you want to respond? Is, is that the end of the rounds? This I'm not looking for another round. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And I'm glad we sparked vigorous debate on this. I, I think that we should debate policy issues in public like this more often because um, you know, we, we learn this way and we can collaborate this way. And I think it's fantastic. And I think to the folks in the International Programs Department, one thing that I hope you take away from this is that up and down this dais, you've heard support for your work. And what I hope you see in this amendment is a way to save money without impacting the scope and the footprint of your work. That was the intent. Appreciate the work you're doing uh, and wanted to make sure I said that. Um, and if there, there, to the extent there was a suggestion that this has any possibility of creating a negative safety outcome, I would never consider this if that was possible in my in my opinion. So uh, I don't think that is a possibility here, given that we're covering the same ground. I, I did want to respond to a couple of specific points. Alex, you brought up China uh, and, and the firewall there, and I asked staff where they plan to do in person trainings this year. I wanted to make sure I understood what we were potentially impacting, and I reviewed the plans in this document as well. And your word that remote training options won't be useful for China, given the firewall, which I understand that position. Thankfully, there were no in person trainings planned for mainland China this year. The, the plans that they identified said that they are planning a virtual only event for audiences in China. Which does cut against that point uh, of the inability to get behind that firewall okay. uh, and staff did not identify. Um, uh, staff did identify wanting to conduct an in person event in Taiwan. But Taiwan is not under China's firewall. So, according to staff, there should be no impact on our planned trainings if we switch to virtual. You also mentioned if we do intergovernmental trainings in certain countries and there is industry next door in the room next door, we won't be able to go talk to them. That's false. If there are no additional costs, they can do that within budget. They can absolutely do that. Where we deleted the words in person, that was to a key performance measure that would have measured them on whether they conducted trainings in person or virtually. Doesn't impact that. Uh, and, and to where uh, the question from Commissioner Boyle as to where the $88,000 came from, that was directly from international program staff who identified for us the cost of translations for doing trainings virtually and the cost of, that would happen if they did those trainings in person. And that's directly where that, that money came from. Um, so with that, I'd hope for your support on the amendment. Can I Sorry. just respond to that? I appreciate on the 88000 That may have been provided to you, Commissioner Trumka, but it was not provided to me. Um, hearing no additional comments, I do appreciate the clarification on the, the, um, uh, trainings, uh, when they're out on business for the internet governmental, um, but I still think that my underlying issues are rain. So I'm going to turn to a vote at this point in time. Commissioner Feldman, how do you vote? I vote yes. Commissioner Boyle, how do you vote? No. Commissioner, sorry, I just skipped you. Commissioner Trumpka. No you problem. Vote? I vote yes. Um, uh, Commissioner Ziak, how do you vote? Yes. And I vote no. The yeses are three, the noes are two. The amendment uh, is adopted. Commissioner Trumka, do you have additional amendments? Yes. And I would love vigorous debate on this one as well, but I'm not sure I see it coming. Um, Trumka, Trumka two. And if I could describe that, um, you know, I think my top priority and a number of our top priorities here is preventing infant sleep deaths tied to consumer products. And I remember how scary those first few months uh, with a baby can be. I remember what it feels like to expect that the products we buy for our babies will keep them safe instead of putting them in danger. 
Unfortunately, we know that that's not always true. And we need to continue making progress so that we can end infant sleep deaths tied to consumer products. I ask my fellow commissioners to support this vital work by voting to study uh, product hazards associated with infant sleep deaths. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we turn to consideration of this minute. I'm going to start with myself for five minutes. And this one, we can have agreement. Um, you know, during my time as chair, this commission has made enormous, enormous strides in improving infant safety and addressing infant sleep hazards. We've implemented and enforced uh, infant uh, sleep products rule, the Safe Sleep for Babies Act, and have issued final rules to improve the safety of nursing pillows and infant support cushions, and have begun a rule looking at improving the safety of infant rockers. And I agree with my colleague that continued research in this area is essential. So I will support this amendment, uh, which calls out the need for such research, establishes its pri priority, and it provides staff the flexibility in identifying the, the research that's most productive in addressing infant sleep hazards. Um, with that, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate my colleague's amendment. Whenever the commission advances uh, rules to reduce infant uh, sleep death, uh, they should be based on reliable data and sound research. This amendment would uh, help do that, and I intend to support it. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I plan on supporting this amendment. Protecting infants, especially in the sleep environment, is central to the work of the commission. And to the extent that we can continue to hone research that will advance this work and our understanding of infant sleep deaths in the context of the safety and risks of products associated with those deaths, I wholeheartedly support such research. That said, as written, the amendment is very broad and I think could benefit from a more directed focus so that the research is more likely to produce material that will be actionable and more useful in informing the work we do at the Commission. Therefore, I would hope that before any funds are expanded, expended on this work, staff would report back to the Commission, perhaps through the mid-year process, on a more clearly defined scope and actionable objectives. Thank you. Commissioner Ziak. Thank you. Protecting our youngest and most vulnerable is a priority of this commission. Each day I read sobering news of infant sleep deaths. Therefore, I intend to support this amendment efforts to further study infant sleep deaths and continue the commission's important work on this issue. Thank you. Commissioner Trump, did you have any concluding thoughts? I very much uh, appreciate the consideration and uh, support for the amendment. With that, we're going to move to a vote on the amendment. Commissioner Feldman? I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Zia? Yes. I vote yes as well. The yeses are five, the noes are zero, and the amendment by Commissioner Trumka is adopted. Did you have additional amendments? I, I do. Trumka three. Please describe the amendment. So last year, the commission set a goal for how many of our recall announcements are reaching consumers by email. Uh, this year, the draft plan proposed lowering the goal to below the numbers that we actually achieved last year. It's not time to lower the bar. We need to continue reaching as many consumers with our message as we can. So I'm putting forward an amendment to match our target to the level we achieved last year, a 20%, a 28% unique open rate uh, on emails. And I ask for your support. There's second. Second. Having heard second, we're now going to move consideration of the amendment. Um, I appreciate the amendment. I understand where you're coming from. Staff proposed a benchmark uh, email open rate. Uh, that does align with what other federal government agencies are doing. Um, but the reason that I have concerns is that the, the metric is fairly new for the Office of Communications and staff is adjusting it to reflect the reality and best practices. Um, well, comms exceeded the proposed best, well, comms was uh, recognized that the, they set a benchmark this is new for them. They don't have the history to say whether it's going to uh, meet what they did this year as last year. And the typical way for agencies to be able to meet the metric is to remove uh, script scribers who have stopped opening the emails for, for months. While this practice may be common from a marketing perspective, uh, it effectively reduces the outreach potential of our recall and safety messaging and runs counter to our mission. I think anybody who opens it up even once every few months and finds out about a recall or about safety information should be reached out by the agency. So I don't think it's a good idea to set an incentive for the comms uh, office to reduce the agency's resource in order to hit a metric. Uh, for that uh, reason, I, I have uh, planned to vote against the amendment. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also appreciate my colleagues work on this amendment. Uh, it's my understanding that this would 
uh, uh, realign the the metric with uh, with the targets that we've hit previously. Uh, I, I uh, uh, intend to support that. Thank you, Commissioner Ball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't support the amendment. I, I do not think the commission, with the limited information we have on the day-to-day -day operations of individual office functions, should be micromanaging performance targets of this nature. I defer to staff's knowledge and set expertise on setting open rates and won't be supporting the amendment for that reason. Mr. Ziak. Thank you, and I appreciate my colleagues' concerns. Uh, I will support the amendment. I think uh, not backsliding to the uh, general government rate is important. And the 28% uh, figure comes from this past year. So uh, hopefully we can do that. But uh, you know, if, if there is a significant change from last year, we can revisit that next year. Thank you. Mr. Trump, did you have any closing? Nope, thank you for your consideration. Uh, can I turn to a vote on the amendments? Uh, Commissioner Feldman? I vote yes. Mr. Tromka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? No. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. And I vote no. The yeses are three, the noes are two, and the amendment is adopted. Uh, Commissioner Tromka, did you have another amendment? Last one, Trumpka four. Um, this also has to do with our, our, uh, our targets. And I introduced a, an amendment two years ago to publicize our success by tracking the number of voluntary standards that we, uh, that we participated in that led to a positive safety change. And the commission voted to adopt that amendment, and we set 20 uh, improved voluntary standards per year as our goal. This year, the draft, the draft plan proposed lowering that goal to 19, while at the same time expanding the list of voluntary standards that we will participate in. 20 remains the minimum acceptable goal, uh, so I ask for your support in keeping that target. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we're going to turn consideration of the amendment. I'm going to recognize myself for, for five minutes. To, to me, this fundamentally doesn't recognize the world that we're living in because we are living in a more constrained environment with less resources. And it's hard for staff to know where to prioritize and where they, they, they don't prioritize. Uh, from what I understand the operating plan, they reduce the number um, to reflect that reality of where the 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 devotion to resources is going to be to increase this metric um, without identifying additional funding or um, or resources um, puts a strain on staff who are working hard every day to be able to, to achieve these goals. It also means that likely that staff will now have to divert from somewhere else to figure out how to meet the metrics uh, if they are raised. So there will be more work on voluntary standards but perhaps that means that there's less work in other areas that EXRR is going to be be doing. So um, I think that the 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 metric that was proposed by staff reflects what they believed was the best balance out in the end of the day. Um, but if there's a desire to prioritize the voluntary standards work, I, I understand that. But uh, I support what staff has provided to us as a balance. Um, Commissioner Feldman. Again, I, I want to thank my colleague, Commissioner Trumpka, for his work on this amendment. I, I, I do intend to support it. Commissioner Boyle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And for the same reasons I opposed the previous amendment, I do not plan to support this change. I do not think the commission should be micromanaging targets such as these. I defer to staff's knowledge and expertise on setting performance targets of this nature and will not be supporting the amendment for that reason. Commissioner Ziak. I appreciate that. I intend to support the amendment. Mr. Trump, could you share closing? Thank you for your consideration. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to move to a vote on the amendment. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, how do you vote? I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? No. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. And I vote no. The yeses are three, the noes are two, and the amendment is adopted. Uh, did you have any additional amendments? I do not. Uh, moving now to Commissioner Boyle. Do you have amendments? Yes, I do. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have Boyle Amendment 1 that's being distributed. Please describe it. Okay. Um, this amendment uh, proposes a pilot program to evaluate the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to meet the agency's needs for translating recalls into Spanish. During my tenure as a commissioner, I have repeatedly emphasized the agency's responsibility to reach Spanish-speaking consumers with timely and actionable product safety information, especially when it comes to recalls. News about unsafe products should reach consumers where they are, 
and by posting recalls on our website in Spanish, the agency expands the impact of our work, enabling Spanish speakers to protect themselves and their families. This amendment is the next logical step to sustain the recent efforts made by the commission to provide Spanish translations, an effort that was renewed in 2023, relying on a contract with the State Department for translation services. The funding to date has been drawn from ARPA, a temporary source, and there are no guarantees of future funds to replace that source. Now is the time to plan for what happens next. My amendment directs the staff to conduct a pilot to assess the capabilities of artificial intelligence and machine learning tools to meet the agency's needs for translating recalls into Spanish. The amendment requires that an intra-agency team be tasked with developing a report on how artificial intelligence and machine learning could facilitate translation of both recalls and unilaterals. The goal is to improve timeliness, eliminating the current lag between publication in English and publication in Spanish, provide acceptable quality, and reduce costs. The amendment also encourages staff to apply the lessons learned to another of the agency's important public-facing consumer tools, saferproducts.gov. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Pam Springs and her staff for all of their ongoing efforts to prioritize outreach in Spanish through social media, website updates, safety education materials, and more. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we turn to consideration of the amendment. I'll start with myself, um, recognize myself for five minutes. Um, I think it's a very interesting amendment that could result in lower cost solutions to the continued Spanish uh, language recall translations that that we're doing. Um, I appreciate that you're positing as a pilot as well, so that we can take a look at what the results are and then uh, do the, the best next step for consumers plan to support. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you uh, again. I, I want to recognize the leadership uh, at, that that my colleague uh, Commissioner Boyle has shown on on the uh, the issue of translations. I do intend to, to support this amendment. Uh, I'm concerned about translation accuracy, uh, but I'm encouraged by improvements in in, in uh, AI recall technologies, which I, I think is progressing leaps and bounds. It's iterative. Um, I, I think the amendment's both well timed and, and offers a, 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 a best chance of a, a, a solution that uh, that that's respective and protective of uh of of agency resources and uh and making sure that we're uh providing accurate and timely information including about recalls to all american communities uh, i'd also like to uh recognize and, and thank um our, our director of communications uh pam springs who i think is doing a terrific job uh with that i'll yield the balance of my time commissioner uh boyle uh, well it's your oh sorry too many amendments uh long night Commissioner day so far thank you uh recall information needs to be translated into the many languages that people speak in america no question about that uh, i've been advocating for that since i've been here at the commission and I've, I've also been pushing for us to to use the readily available translation tools that are ubiquitous everywhere else um, rather than the costly and extraordinarily slow process of manual translations by third party contractors. So I support this amendment. I hope that we complete the pilot within the next couple months so that we can consider adopting recommendations from it at the mid year decisional. Commissioner Wall doesn't get to speak at this point in time. Commissioner Zia. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate Commissioner Boyle's continued work to increase the Commission's translation of recall notices into other languages to improve their reach. She's been a champion in this issue, and I thank her for that. Over the course of the past year, I've had numerous conversations with our executive director and his team, including our uh, IT team, about increasing the commission's use of AI and ML. And this is an example of how those efforts can increase commission efficiency. And therefore, I thank Commissioner Boyle for her amendment, plan to support it. Uh, now, Commissioner Boyle, do you have any concluding thoughts? No, I just wanna thank my colleagues and I appreciate the recognition, thank you. Going to move to a vote on the amendment. Uh, Commissioner Feldman? I vote yes. Commissioner Tronka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. And I vote yes as well. The yeses are five, the noes are zero, and the amendment is adopted. Commissioner Boyle, do you have another amendment? I do, and I am happy to say it's the last of the day, I believe, for those keeping track. Uh, this is uh, Boyle Amendment 2. Uh, which I believe has been distributed to uh, my colleagues. This is a very straightforward amendment. 
It clarifies that uh, the mid-year process uh, is tied not only to the level of funds appropriated to the agency by Congress, but also to unexecuted balances assessed through the mid-year evaluation. Although the Commission approves funding levels through the operating plan, a certain level of unexecuted funds accumulates each year for a variety of reasons, including staff vacancies and contracts that may not get executed. This amendment merely confirms the need for a mid-year process, regardless of the level of appropriated funds the agency may receive, and that the mid-year process involves staff getting specific authorization from the Commission for the use of funds above the $150 million level set out in this year's operating plan and or for the excuse me, unexecuted balances. I uh, thank my colleagues for their support. There a second. Second. Having heard a second, we now turn to consideration of the amendment. Uh, Commissioner Ball, thank you for the amendment. As you said, and my understanding is that it's to ensure that we're going to have a mid-year review of the operating plan, and I am happy to support that. Commissioner Feldman. I, I thank my colleague for her amendment. I, I'm also uh, happy to support it as well. Commissioner Trumka. As am I. Commissioner Ziak. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Boyle. I think it's important that uh, at the mid-year, the commission follow up and provide staff the appropriate direction. Therefore, I intend to support the amendment. Any additional thoughts, Commissioner Wall? No, just thank you to my colleagues. Uh, that we're going to turn to a vote. Commissioner Feldman? I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. Commissioner Ziak? Yes. I vote yes as well. The yeses are five, the noes are uh, zero. With that, the, the amendment is adopted. Commissioner Wall, do you have any additional amendments? No, I don't. Commissioner Ziak, do you have any amendments? I, I do not, though I, I consider joking about the 10 amendments I have, but no, I do not. Thank you. Um, hearing no additional amendments or motions, I move to approve the FY uh, 2025 operating plan as amended. Is there a second? Second. Uh, we have second and now can move to a vote. Commissioner Feldman, how do you vote? I vote yes. Commissioner Trumka, I vote. Yes. Commissioner Boyle. Yes. Commissioner Ziak. Yes. Uh, and I vote yes as well. So there are five yeses to adopt the plan and, and the operating plan as amended passes. We're now going to have up to 10 minutes per commissioner for any closing remarks and uh, I'm going to start and I'm going to start where I began, which is thanking the staff for all of their work, both on this document and then all the work they do every day on behalf of consumers. The plan that was put before us is thoughtful. It's an ambitious plan, given the resources that we anticipate and it reflects the dedication of you all to the missions of the agency. I know the budget limitations are frustrating for all of us and the staff will be the ones who are directly impacted by the choices made on the dais today. I will have to say I'm disappointed that my colleagues move forward with the, uh, the amendment that has dramatically cut back on CPSC's international programs. We do live in a global economy and half our consumer products are imported. And if we're going to work to ensure that the products that the Americans are buying are safe for use, we have to ensure that they, they are um, produced safely and consistent with our standards. Um, and so we have to engage with producers abroad. Uh, to the international program staff, you know, I'm painfully aware of the 61, now 61% cut to your budget, and that's going to have real consequences for your work. Uh, but I urge you to keep going on in your work as best as you can. It's important and it matters. Um, you've heard this time and time again from many uh, people in the product safety community, both at home and overseas. I've been told that at the conferences that I've gone to and I've seen your work in person. I hope over the next few months uh, to that my colleagues will reconsider their actions and I will look to develop better arguments than I've made today. Um, we have a lot to get done this fiscal year. The operating plan has some very strong priorities, and I look forward to seeing what we can get done this year. With that I'm going to turn to my colleagues, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I am pleased that this commission was able to come together and adopt our governing document for the year. Uh, we should be proud of this work. It's encouraging uh, to have this collegial approach. It hasn't escaped my attention that today is November 6th, and while there's always talk of dysfunction in Washington, today's operating plan demonstrates that consensus is achievable with hard work. My thanks extend to all of my colleagues, but especially to the Chairman Alex, you ran a good process again this year, uh, and I'm, I'm pleased that we and our staffs worked together so well 
Uh, thank you uh, again. Job well done. Uh, I, I'd like to offer thanks again to to our staff for presenting this plan and offering technical feedback along the way. The 2025 operating plan presents an opportunity for the commission to work every day uh, uh, to uh, this fiscal year and, and, and beyond to protect Americans from the unreasonable risks of injury and death associated with consumer products. The operating plan is a planning tool for the fiscal year. It reflects the agency's priorities, the resources allocated to these priorities, and the standards by which we will measure success. The plan includes uh, important initiatives such as improving the safety of consumer products before they reach the marketplace. It uh, includes the important work that our, our port inspectors and the frontline staff do every day. I'm pleased that uh, many of my amendments uh, were adopted as part of the final plan. CPSC will continue its important work to ensure that e-commerce platforms are assessed and evaluated for compliance uh, with our consumer protection laws and regulations. Uh, we're providing clear direction to the commission uh, uh, for, for the commission to address unsafe products that arrive uh, at the doorsteps of American consumers from China and elsewhere. Uh, I'm also pleased that my amendments on uh, import initiatives, such as designating a uh, important initiatives, such as designating a formal liaison. Uh, between CPSC and the, the state, uh, state attorneys general was included. Uh, this step underscores the important relationship and the opportunity for collaboration between CPSC and attorneys general with respect to their efforts at consumer protection. Uh, the plan now includes uh, efforts to evaluate and confirm the financial state of firms uh, subject to enforcement before the firms are uh, able to plead inability to pay defenses uh, against requested remedies and, uh, and, and civil penalty assessments. The plan seeks to uh, align the cost of recall translations with the recalling firm and not American taxpayers. Finally, and I think most importantly, uh, in, in recognition of, uh, uh, in, in support of tribal sovereignty, uh, CPSC will now uh, establish standards for uh, consultation with, uh, with, with American Indian and Alaska Native uh, tribal nations. Uh, such standards will facilitate communications between our agency and tribal nations as we seek to spread awareness about consumer safety and serve tribal members as we do all Americans. Of course, there are things that I would have pursued differently in this plan, but I'm pleased that the commission staff has put together a consensus product to direct its work. Uh, I look forward to working with stakeholders, Congress staff, all of you uh, to implement uh, the provisions of this plan and make sure that uh, we are protecting as many consumers as possible. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back the remainder of my time. Commissioner Tomka. Today's discussion and, and agreements provide a great example of how we can support each other's ideas to improve the vision for this agency in the year ahead. I'm appreciative of my fellow commissioners for the improvements that they brought forward and for your support on the improvements that I brought forward, particularly the cementing of our commitment to the prevention of infant sleep deaths. Thank you. Commissioner Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time last year, I, ref I reflected on the many projects that had languished for too long on the Commission's agenda, rolling from one year to the next and leaving little room for bold initiatives and new ideas. I'm disappointed to report that one year hence, too many of those projects remain stubbornly stuck on the agenda, and today's discussion did nothing to grapple with how to advance those issues or take on the dire warnings we have heard. I fear that our discussion today lost the forest for the trees. In my view, these tight resources require a more holistic assessment and transparency is critical as choices are made over the course of the next fiscal year. We are seeing the trees making small adjustments here and there, but missing the big picture. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And in concluding, I'd like to thank our staff, especially our executive director, Austin Schlick, and his team, as well as Rob Carroll, who is uh, in an acting capacity, but did yeoman's work on getting this document to the commission. And equally importantly, all the teams that sit behind you who provided input to get this done. I'd like to commend my colleagues for an open, productive and collaborative process. We disagreed disagreeably, and that says something. Being the last speaker on the dais, I know everyone will appreciate my uncharacteristically sudden brevity, but I conclude my remarks and thank you again. Thank you again to my colleagues and staff for working on this package. This concludes today's decisional meeting of Consumer Product Safety Commission. We are going to take a break for 10 minutes to clear the room for a closed meeting that will start um, thereafter. <laughs>